thinking, just before we go on, can I say that I'm very conscious that your instructing solicitors have to sit with masks on, um, and I can only apologise for that. Apparently, Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service insist on it, and therefore we have no option but to agree. But I, um, as somebody who dislikes wearing masks personally very, very much, um, but have done over the last 18 months, um, they have my sympathies. So um, we'll try not to, from the bench, we'll try not to prolong it for that reason. Yes. Thank you, my lord. Uh, moving to ground one, my lord, and the right move terms. Uh, I have four overarching submissions. First, that the company I say I submit is expressly permitted to advertise properties on behalf of commercial uh, letting agents only to the definition of your client and agent. Second, the right move terms contained no clear or express statement of the alleged restriction, despite its commercial importance, as contended for by my learned friend, and despite all the definitions required to form it being in place within the T's and C's. Third, paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines doesn't constitute the restriction. And fourth, there is no scope in my submission for a commercial or purposive interpretation on these facts. And even if there were, it would favour the, the um, submissions I make that there is no prohibition rather than my learned friend's submission. Submission, first submission. M my lords, I, I will go briefly to the 2009 terms since my learned friend referred to them for uh, various purposes, but I'll, but I'll take it quickly. Those are in the supplemental bundle, tab 5, page 59. Okay, that's... Yes, sorry. This is, this is a covering email, um, an email from Right Move to Mr. Brett Butcher, uh, enclosing blank form and then the terms are on page 62. So my lords may already have seen top left the definition of agent means any person, firm or corporate entity in the business of selling or letting uh, residential or commercial properties or land on behalf of a third party. I draw my lords attention also to the definition of landlord means any person, firm or corporate entity marketing and or managing property they assume is a let. That I submit is a conventional definition of a, of a landlord. It's someone who owns the property. I'm sorry to interrupt. Why, why are we looking at these? Aren't we only concerned with the construction of the 2014 terms? Principally, absolutely, my lord. Learned friend placed some reliance on 2009 terms. Well, he referred to one provision. But do, we, do we need to go through all the definitions here? I, I'm, I'm not going to go as by any means. I've got one other, one other quick extract. My lord. I, I won't spend more than a, another 40 seconds. Mm. I'm sorry for the, for the inconvenience of that, my lord. But, but I would just also, finally, the definition of your client, um, my lords. Your client means an agent, developer, or landlord who has instructed you to market property, land, or developments on their behalf. Now, that answers my learned friend's who, not what point, because here, your client isn't just a who. It's not just who, an agent. It's also what. In these terms, we see your client is an agent who has instructed you to market property on their behalf. So that's contemplated as of, 2000, as of the 2009 terms. Um, uh, then there's the only other clause, my lords, is, is C1, where there's the warranty in the same terms as 2014. You warrant... Yes, Michael, I'm, I'm not understanding how that helps you if, that's, if, it, if there's a different definition in the 2014 terms, which is what we're concerned with. Uh, well, my lord... It, it might be said against you, well... Uh, by choosing to delete that wording in the 2014 terms, uh, it, it supports your opponent's argument. Uh, it, it, well, it, I, I accept my lord most of these points. I, I, I'm covering 2009 only because my learned friend seems to place some reliance on them as an aid to construction of the. Well, C19 we looked at. That's the only one we looked at. So I'll, 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 move, I'll move on from there. That, that, was, that, that was all I wished, uh, wished to highlight. So, so the 2014. Terms, my lords, back in core bundle, uh, tab 20, of course. Yeah. And 
and on page 230. Clause 4.2.1, it is a warranty that you and where applicable, your client carry on business as an agent, developer or landlord, and you have not misrepresented the nature of your business to us. So here is the express representation that, that your client carries on business as an agent. And the definition of agent, I won't take the law student, but again, a commercial business. <coughs> The only, the only definitions I, I would take them all briefly to are back on page 228. Landlord, that means a person marketing and or managing property that they own or let. And down at the bottom, there's property owner, which means a person that has instructed you to market for sale or to let his or her or its residential or commercial property is her or its possession of the property. Therefore, my lords, I submit that this contract um, does expressly envisage a member's client's being an, quote, agent, which is a commercial letting agent, and doesn't include any express prohibition against uh, a member listing properties for another commercial letting agent, i.e. someone who doesn't own the property, notwithstanding that there are clear definitions of landlord and property owner. So if the objective intention of the parties had been to limit the who or the what to landlords as defined or property owners as defined, I submit it's likely that that would have been stated expressly. It may not matter for the purposes of your submissions, but what's the distinction between landlord and property owner? But I... I we are probably, my lord, again in the in the case of sets and subsets. A, a, a landlord would be a subset of a property owner. I suppose a landlord is someone intending to um, let the property, whereas someone might, who, intending to sell their property on right move would not be a landlord. They'd be a property owner. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. I see. Thank you. Yes. Okay. There are my lords, so that's my that's my prime submission, um, and the one that the judge accepted below. There's an express permission to um, um, have agents as a member's client. Uh, there are some other uh, indicia within the two. Well, no, I'm not going to go to 2009 terms. Um, I will uh, skip on, my lords, to the point that. Um, these terms also contemplate um, what happens if a, a property is wrongfully listed, and they include provisions in relation to the changing of, of prices. Uh, yeah, just before, before we get on to that, yes. um, can I just ask you a question about definition? Because um, we have been referred, at least in the skeleton arguments, to the definition of technical guidelines. Yes. Um, and um, one can see from that that the definition of technical guidelines is expressed by reference to, quote, the services. And there is a definition of services as the services provided by right view, which is described in greater detail in the product guidelines. Now, nobody's referred uh, uh, in writing to that definition or indeed the product guidelines at all. Um, am I right in assuming from that that? one doesn't get anything out of it. I think that's correct, my lord. OK, thank you. I, and I'm going to come back to that definition of technical guidelines when I make my submissions about um, clause 22. Clause 22, because it is, it is relevant. Yeah. Um, so, so, my lords, um, uh, clause 5 of the main terms and conditions on page 230. My learned friend suggested I relied only on clause 5.4 as being the mechanism to vary prices. That's, that's not correct. 
I rely also on clauses 5.2 and 5.3. 5.2 says after expiry of the term, right move may vary the charges from time to time. You will be given 30 days notice of any increase in the charges and right move will send you an amended price schedule. And clause 5.3, if when compared with the majority of our other members, that your location's market or your data includes high volumes of property or land, and or your properties or land are spread over a wide geographical area, or we believe your data includes details of properties or land not from one of your locations, then in accordance with any guidance that we may set out and communicate to you from time to time, we reserve the right to charge you for additional locations or in a manner we deem equivalent to your volume or to charge you on a per property basis. So that's a wide discretion that Rightly retains to itself to ensure that they can increase or vary their prices or their mechanism of pricing if they consider that an, a given member is listing too many properties compared with other members. And is it your submission to be clear that that would be applicable in the circumstances with which you, we are concerned in the present case? Uh, well, it depends on precisely which circumstances we're, we're, we're talking about, my Lord. But well, if The circumstances alleged by the, the defendant. Yes, ex yes, my lord. So, in in circumstances where a given member um, lists property on behalf of other commercial letting agents, which I say they're not prohibited from doing or expressly permitted to do, and as a result, uh, there are uh, sticking with the contractual wording, um, high volumes of property. Uh, in, in those circumstances, right move can increase their prices, vary their prices as they as they see fit. So you rely upon high volumes of property. Um, what about, we believe your data includes details of property not from one of your locations. Does that read on or not? Well, well it's an alternative. It's an, it's an or, my lord. So uh, but what, what I do say and what I do submit, and one of the points I was going to come on to, is that uh, even if there is a putative breach of the conditions, in the sense that a member uh, lists properties which are not from one of your locations, uh, and we should probably look at the definition of, uh, of your location since, since it's become relevant in that way. Um, identified two, two, in your... It's at 228. It means the physical locations yes. identified on your membership application form. Precisely. In this case, means the website, doesn't it? It does, Even though my lord, yes. wouldn't naturally be described as a physical location. It, it, it wouldn't, my lord, no. So the most direct answer is it doesn't, that bit doesn't bite on these facts, but I'm trying to, exp I, I would say it certainly works with my, <coughs> excuse me, um, with my um, overall interpretation, um, because e even in the case of um, a, a, an agent with 10, uh, 10, different offices, if they wrongfully list uh, properties from, if they only sign up with five of their locations to right move and they don't sign up with the other five and they try to sleeve instructions from those other five, the consequence of that is set out in, in 5.3, it's right move uh, uh, allowing to make additional charges for those other locations, uh, but it's not in my submission clear that even that would be a breach of these terms. I, I don't need to prove. I don't need to prove that to make good my overarching case that there's no prohibition. But I do say, uh, even in that, on the London Friends case, clearer case of a of a breach, the consequence would be right move being entitled to increase their prices. It doesn't actually spell out explicitly that uh, that would be uh, a breach. Am I right in understanding that what you're particularly relying on here is the fact that one of the alternative bases for charging that's specifically spelled out is on a per property basis? Of course, if there is a charge levied on a per property basis, uh, then any concern about right move losing out would be met. My Lord, yes. yes. I, was, I was going to, uh, I'm sorry, my Lord. I've, 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 I've jumped your fourth head, I apologise. No, that's, that's right. No, my lord, I shouldn't have gone to these clauses until they were relevant to my submissions, I apologise. But, yes, 
but the point is it goes to the commercial interpretation points. Yeah. And the short answer to all of our learned friends and right moves protestations is that if this hypothetical Hebridean um, uh, mastermind manages to list thousands and thousands of properties, right move has this right to simply switch up the basis on which they charge and increase the prices on a per property basis as they see fit. So there is absolutely no commercial disadvantage to right move from what's been described as sleeving. But I'll expand a little on, on that commerciality point in my, in my third point. Uh, my lords, uh, my learned friend's principal answer to um, this submission, as I understand it, is that the definition of your client goes to who, but not what. Who may be a client, but not what services may be provided uh, to that client. Um, in my submission, that answer doesn't work uh, because the terms and conditions, these terms and conditions, objectively envisage right move providing a single service to its members, namely allowing its members to list properties on right move on the website on behalf of their clients. The t these terms and conditions are not concerned with any other service. Thus, the who and the what are identical. If my learned friend had identified some other services uh, that Rightmove um, provided, then he might be able to say, well, the your client who not what point applies to those other services. So if Rightmove had a side business of uh, decorating estate agent offices or something, the learned friend might say, well, the who is another agent, and the what is the sideline decoration business. But there is no such alternative sideline business for right. The learned friends attempted to identify none. Instead, he expressly acknowledges at paragraph 22 of his skeleton that the principal service right move provides to its members is the ability to place adverts on its property listing platform or properties that are either for sale or to list. True enough in my submission. It therefore follows, and in conclusion, uh, in my submission, the right move terms cannot envisage a company having an agent um, as a client without also envisaging the listing of properties of those agent clients on the right move website by the members. Um, now, as I understand it, my learned friend also says, sorry, no, my learned friend does say, um, that his interpretation of your client um, may be reconciled with his interpretation of paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines, because my learned friend says a member needs simply obtain written permission um, in order to provide access to the services and features. He says that at 34.1 of his skeleton. In my submission, that's a uh, that is a bad submission uh, for several reasons. Firstly, my lords, on my learned friend's interpretation, uh, paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines would be the clause that determines what services may be provided to each client. If that were right, then this vital mechanism, this vital commercial mechanism, um, ought to have been very clearly signposted because it's something every member would have to have regard to all the time. But there is no such signposting anywhere in the terms and conditions. Uh, there's no distinguishing between the who and the what of the services in the terms and conditions. My learned friends identified no such distinction. And of course, overarching, they say it's unnecessary because there's a single service being provided. Second point, my lords, is that on my learned friends analysis, this definition of your client becomes mere surplusage. Because it's clause 20, it's paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines that just determines uh, which clients can be taken on to receive the core right move service. And so the definition of your client does nothing, it just sits there, uh, waiting to be filled up with meaning by the application mechanism in paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines. Third point, my lords. Um, Can I just go back to the first point? Of course. The, 
the, the, the who and the what. The clause 11 of the technical guidelines, whatever it may mean, is dealing with the what, is it? Placing a restriction on the what. Take it to the first obvious example. It can't, it can't, can't be property that other than that which is unsold, strip, unlet. And at the last bullet point, you have to take it off. Uh, once, yes. Once it's been sold or let. Second bullet point contains restrictions on management control. So does the first bullet point on a reference to uh, original instructions from a third party, whatever that might mean. But, but leave aside the content. The point I'm putting to you is you say, well, um, you wouldn't expect the, 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 there to be a distinction between the who and the what, and indeed to find the what set out in the technical guidelines. But we do find the what set out in the technical guidelines at Clause 11, don't we? Respectfully, my lord, that's a, that's a different what. Because the learned friend's what is what basic service is to be provided. My overarching submission is Rightmove provides a single service the ability to list properties on its website. And my learned friend says, well, uh, there must be some other what, but we don't know what that other what is. I'm, I'm so, not following that, Matt. The, well, clause, so, clause 11 yes. is plainly dealing with what properties you're allowed to upload onto the site as being marketed. I agree with that, yes. Of course, my Lord. Well, isn't that what this case is about? Whether, whether, whether you, you can't stop someone having a client who is a, a commercial letting agent and may, may provide all sorts of services that, to, to that client who have nothing, nothing to do with right move. Uh, what, what, what the restrictions we're concerned with are, are what services you can provide to that client in okay. terms of, as you say, the service essentially being, can you advertise properties on the website? And clause 11 of the technical guidelines is identifying what properties you can market on the website. That's the point I was putting to you. Um, I accept, my lord, that, that Clause 11 speaks to which properties may, may be listed on the, on the website. On the website. I, yeah. I accept that. But as I understand it, my learned friend's point is still a little different than that. He, he, as I understand it, says, well, these terms may envisage a member having an agent as a client and providing to that agent some service other than the listing of that agent's properties on the website. So my learned friend hasn't explained what that service would be. Well, it might be marketing them not on the website. But then that would have nothing to do with these terms and conditions, my lord. There's no, there would be no reason for these right move terms and conditions to speak to services which are totally divorced uh, from right move. In my solution. I don't, I don't think it did it, but I, I, right. I, I will, though, come back to, to, to Clause 11, which, of course, my own friend doesn't actually rely upon in, in no, this. No, that's a fair point. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my lords, I was, uh, sorry, I, I was at um, reasons why I'm a learned friend's interpretation of, of your client that don't, don't work. I've, I've given, I've offered my first two. Uh, submissions yeah. in relation to that. My, my third submission in relation to that is that there's little or no objective reason for Rightmove's clients, the people reading these terms and conditions, to know that it's paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines that contains this mechanism for determining uh, whom they may provide uh, the services to. Isn't that just a different way of putting the no signposting point? It probably is, my I probably should have combined them, but I'll, but I'll make the points I should have put under that first point anyway. I, I'd simply note that the your client definition, my lord, doesn't refer to paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines. Paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines doesn't refer back to the definition of, of your client, so there's no apparent linkage between uh, those two clauses. Uh, and really, there's, there's nothing else uh, within the terms and conditions which, uh, which do that signposting. Um, I would now just fourthly, my lords, turn to back to the definition of the technical guidelines. 
which are in the terms and conditions, tab 20, page 229. The technical guidelines mean the technical guidelines which, co which contain the description and specification of the software, internet connectivity, e.g. broadband speed, and other technical requirements necessary for the provision of the services, including procedural rules and guide <coughs> guidelines for using the platform. These guidelines are available from our website at Rightmove Plus and may be updated in accordance with 11.2. Um, so uh, an ordinary uh, letting agent looking at that definition, in my submission, wouldn't <coughs> expect to find within the technical guidelines a, mecha a commercial mechanism for determining whom uh, that member may provide services to or what services may be provided to that member. It gives, as the name, uh, as the defined term in the name suggests, that that definition suggests they are merely um, technical uh, requirements uh, related to the proper usage of the uh, platform on a technical level. Uh, fifthly, uh, my lords, um, the technical guidelines themselves, including clause 22, contain no explanation about how this application is supposed to be made for permission uh, to list the properties of any given individual um, agent. If my learned friend's interpretation were correct, then this would be a vital um, commercial mechanism which each member must uh, avail themselves of every time they wish to take on uh, a new client or a new type of uh, client. If that were so, then given Brightmove's uh, enormous scale and its numbers of clients and the number of such applications that will be made, there ought to be a well-defined uh, mechanism uh, for that purpose. But there is none. There's no uh, evidence of there being any such mechanism. That suggests that paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines is concerned with something uh, far less common than applications simply to take on new clients. It is instead concerned with, uh, as I'll come on to say, the unusual, the, the, the very, very unusual um, act of giving over the ability to someone else to use themselves the right move platform, handing over the keys rather than simply taking on a new client. Because that is so uncommon that it would make sense for there to be no specified mechanism for it. Well, I understand that latter point. I'm still I'm a little more puzzled by your starting point with this submission is you say well, nothing about the mechanism, but why would there need to be a mechanism? I mean, what it says is without written permission. I mean it's it's not uncommon to have contractual clauses that require written consent or written authority or written permission um, and it's pretty rare I think isn't it for those kind of clauses to specify and to obtain our written permission the mechanism is as follows well my, my lords my lord I submit there's a significant difference there between um, the sort of written permission which might be obtained on a one-off basis, or you, one might obtain one or two such permissions, a bond call or some significant contractual event, uh, that I can see there being no reason to specify a precise form of the permission or a precise mechanism to obtain it. But on a learned friend's interpretation, um, right moves thousands of uh, members and the tens or hundreds of thousands of clients they have um, would routinely be the subject of these um, applications. So a, a, a company as large and sophisticated as Rightmove, in my submission, would have a standardized system if that is the uh, purpose of this clause, because they'd be receiving hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of these applications under paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines uh, to, take on all these, uh, to take on all these individual yeah. clients. Well, that point I can see, but that's a slightly different point, isn't it? I mean, the point you're now making is to say that on the defendant's interpretation, um, this clause would mean that there would be hundreds or thousands of requests for written permission daily. Um, and th that's, that's just not feasible. Um, yes. But, I mean, that's got nothing to do with saying that there needs to be a mechanism, is there? It's, it's, it's no. all about... Oh. I'm sorry. I, I'm it's sorry. really a point about numbers and, and, yes. and what's, what's logical and, and rational. Yeah, absolutely, I didn't. I didn't mean to submit. I hope I hope it didn't come across in this way. I didn't mean to submit that 
um, this clause didn't operate, couldn't work in the way my learned friend suggests as a matter of contractual analysis unless there was such a written mechanism prescribed. I'm not submitting it's a contractual necessity. I'm saying it's a matter of common sense in the way my lord has just articulated it. Yeah. On my learned friend's interpretation, this paragraph 22 buried in the technical guidelines is the controlling mechanism for determining whom each member may have as their client. And if, if it served that extremely wide purpose, it, it seems inherently likely there would be a well-defined, straightforward mechanism for obtaining that permission. That, that's the only point I wish to make. Um, my lords, the, the, my second overarching point in relation to, to ground one is, is simply, and I probably need to say no more about it, but the alleged restriction is not stated expressly or clearly anywhere in these in these terms and uh, conditions, notwithstanding, as I've noted, uh, there are the five, there are all the ingredients in place via the definitions of agent, developer, landlord, property owner, all those elements, the puzzle pieces are there. If right move had meant to prescribe this prohibition, it would have been very simple for those, uh, those defined terms to have been slotted together easily to constitute a prohibition. But I move on then, my lords, to my third overarching submission, which is that paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines doesn't constitute or give rise to the alleged restriction. Um, I, I was going to make some points about the learned friend's criticism of the ju judge for not grappling with um, paragraph 22, but I, th I think my lords have the point that... Um, well, it's a, it, in one sense, it's it, we are where we are. Clause 22 clearly didn't feature over much, shall we say, in front of the judge. Um, but Clause 19 did, and the, the, as my lord has pointed out, the judge dealt with it, albeit fairly briefly, at uh, I think it's 48 and 49. So um, um, there it is. It's, we, we have to deal with Clause 22. Yes. And, and you already made a number of submissions about Clause 22. Yes. Paragraph 22, I'm sure. Indeed. Indeed. Um, I'd, I'd only simply, to the extent it is relevant, I just ask my lords to review my learned friend's skeleton in the hearing below, paragraphs 38 to 53, which is in the supplemental bundle, tab 11, pages 313 to 316, where he sets out his arguments in relation to each of the clauses he relied upon below, and he doesn't make submissions in relation to paragraph 22 of the technical. So I'm going to accept that's right. It is expressly referenced in my skeleton below. But my learned friend quotes paragraph 22, but doesn't make any submissions about it. That, that's why my, my advice that we are where we are, we yes. need to get on, is that, that's sound right. advice. Indeed. And I recommend that it's accepted. C certainly, my lord. Um, so, um, paragraph 22 itself. Um, I, I, I've made submissions already, so I'll, I'll cut this as, as short as I, as I possibly uh, can. Um, my lords already have, have the point as to the definition of, of the technical guidelines and my lords put to my learned friend this morning about the general nature and content of those uh, technical guidelines. They are technical matters, um, but which is not where one would expect to, to find in general um, in, indicated or restrictions on the commercial bargain uh, between the parties. Um, paragraph uh, 22 uh, itself, um, in the core bundle, uh, tab 21, page 241. The Lords, of course, have already seen, uh, but you warrant that you will not, uh, without our written permission, directly, or in our opinion, indirectly, sell on or provide access to the services and features of your membership to third parties. Uh, I've set out in some detail in my skeleton uh, the alternative interpretations um, of this clause. Um, in uh, my submission, all these words have their natural, ordinary meaning. The services and features of your membership means the ability to list properties on rightmove.com, not the ordinary uh, task or act of making a listing or having one's property listed. It's the ability to effectuate listers, 
rather than the act of an individual listing or having one's property listed. And third parties, the other crucial part of this clause, has their ordinary meaning, which is simply that any person, not a party, to this contract between this member and Brightman. Well, Lord Justice Popperfield identified this morning that there was an, another possible interpretation, which is that it means someone who is not merely not a party to the contract, but also not a member, possibly not a client of the member either. What do you say to that? Uh, my Lords, I, I, well, it's not the interpretation I'd rely on for, for this reason. Uh, paragraph 22 would not, um, it's unlikely that it was intended to permit a member to hand over the keys to right move to one of its clients. With, with my Lord, um, Lord Justice's, Lord Justice Popwell's interpretation, if one excludes clients from the definition of third parties, then there would be no prohibition against a given member handing over the username and password to one of their clients. If I was a client of Foxton's, as I am, then Foxton's could simply hand me their login details to write me, because I would not be subject, but that act would not be subject to this paragraph 22. So essentially I say third... So, so let me see if I've understood that submission correctly. You say, for the reason you give just now, it can't mean, can't extend to clients of clients. Um, let's assume just for a minute that's right. What about the other possibility is it means other than members? I'm sorry, my lord, it means... Uh, what, other than members. So third parties other than members. You, you made the same submission again? Third parties other than members. Well, yes, my lord, because in my submission, um, selling on or providing access to the services and features of your membership means giving to someone else the services and features that you as an individual member enjoy, i.e. the ability to list via your username, your account, properties on Rightboot. So one member shouldn't hand over the keys to anyone else. It shouldn't be given to another member. It shouldn't be given to a client. It shouldn't be given to a man on the street. Where, where does the pause come in the last? Is it a prohibition against selling on the services and features or providing access to the services and features? Or is it uh, a, a prohibition on selling on access to the services and features or providing access to the services and features. Do you see the dichotomy I'm putting to you? Is, is sell on uh, independent of the word access? I, d I do follow that, my lord, yes. Uh, I think it would be consonant with your submission if access governed both. So what's the activity is that's prohibited yeah. is selling on or providing, and what must not be sold on or provided is access to the services and features, and that fits with your suggestion that access means physical access in the sense of immediate ability to, to make use of the uploading facility with the login password and so on. Yeah, I, yes, I think that would be more readily consonant with my interpretation, my lord. Otherwise, yes. we've got to find that we've got to find what's meant by selling on the services. Yeah. Well, in my submission, my lord, um, that's a point the learned friend takes. Uh, selling on the services means um, providing act, providing the ability. Sorry, means um, giving the ability to use one's membership to someone else. It means selling it for for a fee, and providing it uh, for, rather than selling it on means doing it without a fee. So I can't sell you my password. And I can't just give you my password. Yes, and that, I mean, that, that I understand that if if access governs both of the, act, the activities. Yes. If, if it doesn't, one's got uh, a, a more difficult inquiry as to what's meant by selling on services. Uh, my lord, I, I accept that. So my, my primary position, my primary submission is that um, sell on and provide, they both govern the word, or access governs both of those terms. That's my primary position. Yes. My alternative position, my lords, would be that 
um, one gets to the same place with the words the services and features of your membership because the services and features of your membership is the same thing the features of your the services and the features enjoyed by your membership is is the ability to list properties on right yes well that's point that's put against you if it is if, yeah. if, 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 if the, the, the prohibition is only on selling on these services that is to say the ability to list on right move in the sense of the ability to market your properties that would be wide enough to cover the activity we're concerned with yeah, my lord yes I, I, I accept that if if services and features of your membership is interpreted in that wider way that is that is my learned friends analysis I, I accept that but the real reason that doesn't work, my lords, is one requires this tortured interpretation of third party. So, so to summarise briefly, I mean, the two key points on your submissions, if I've understood correctly, are first of all, the one identified by my Lord, Lord Justice Hopper, about what is governed by the word access. Um, and you say that that supports your reading of, of services and features of, of membership. But then secondly, if access is not interpreted in that way, or, or if it, it doesn't, it, it, selling on is independent, as it was put earlier, um, then you point to third parties and say, well, hold on a minute. Uh, if we interpret selling on as, as independent and services and features as, as broadly enough to cover this situation, then it covers everyone because of third party. Exactly. You then get to the learner judge blows astute observation in my submission that it would be odd um, to open the door so widely with the definition of your client and then to shut it by this paragraph 22 so that every single listing of anyone's property was prohibited unless expressly permitted. Yeah, but on that you didn't at least in your skeleton argument rely upon the conflict resolution provision. Um, well Lord, that's true and I should have it's a good point. So you do adopt the point that if there is a conflict, then the contract says that the general terms and conditions prevail. Yes. Yeah. So uh, overall, my lords, I, I submit that some sense has to be made of this paragraph 22. I submit it's not a sensible conclusion to say it prohibits any listing of anyone's property whatsoever, because then one really would require express permission for each individual listing, and that's just not a sensible way to have constructed these terms. So that sensible limitation either comes from the way in which one interprets sell on or provide access to the services and features of your membership, either the limitation is found there on, with the interpretation I propose, or it's found by this, in my respectful submission, somewhat tortured interpretation of third parties as referring only to commercial letting agents or only to some other subset of people, which means something other than uh, one would ordinarily understand third parties uh, to be. And in my submission, the more sensible way of constraining this clause is with the interpretation, with the uh, more limited interpretation of sell on or provide access to the services and features of your membership. meant anything other than all third parties, um, then one would be permitted, or one would not be prohibited, from selling on or providing access to the services and features of your membership to whichever people remained within that limited definition of third party. So if we excluded, as, as I understand it, my learned friend says third parties means those 
who are not themselves eligible for membership. So such as my lords or myself. I am not eligible for membership of right move because I have a single buy to let property. On the learned friend's interpretation, there'd be nothing to prevent any existing member of right move um, from providing access to the services and features of their membership uh, to me, handing over to me their login details. So I don't think Learned Friend suggests that um, the handing over of login details is not covered. He says it covers that and other things. Uh, so there'd be no restriction against that unless third parties is sufficiently expansive, given its normal meaning, so as to prevent it. And furthermore, my lords, uh, my learned friend's interpretation, uh, on my learned friend's interpretation, sell on or provide access to the services and features of your membership is equivalent simply to listing a property on right move. Uh, and if that is all that was meant, those simpler and clearer words in my submission would have been used. My lords, um, points then I'm sorry, my lords, that one might then ask, well, why would right move require a particular prohibition against giving over the ability to others to list properties on the website? Why is that something which must be restrained? And in my submission, the answer is um, right move must maintain control over the types and the quality of the data uh, on the website. They didn't. They don't want malicious information or inappropriate um, um, visual content or whatever else being uploaded to the website. Uh, and that is why uh, they uh, wish to ensure that each member who is bound by the right move terms doesn't hand over the the ability to someone else to simply upload content directly onto the right move website because uh, who knows what they might uh, put up there. Uh, my, 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 my learned friend, as I understand it, suggests well that same problem arises if a, a given uh, member were to list properties on behalf of another commercial agent. My learned friend suggests that, that gives rise to the same problem, that Rightmove loses the ability to control who puts properties up on the website or, or what is put up onto the website. But in my submission, that's not right, provided one properly interprets paragraph 22, as I say. Because uh, in that scenario, uh, the member, in our case, the company, remains the entity which is uploading information onto, onto Rightmove. They are the filter, and they are the protector of right move and the quality of the data on the site. Well, there's a certain amount of bootstraps in that. Uh, I think I think oh. the point that's put against you is that there are elements of control uh, which the platforms would want to have, but are not limited to uh, the uh, sort of data that's put up in the sense of the way it's put up and so on, but relate to the properties themselves, whether they've been on the market for four years, or whether they're not in fact available for let, those, all those sorts of things. My lord, true enough, but none of those protections is lost merely because a given member is uploading properties which another agent has asked them to upload. If, if I, as a, as a non-professional, come to a given member and say, please upload my property, it's been on the market for eight years already, but please put it up, the member can say no yes, or whatever else. If another commercial agent says, please put up these five properties for us, they've been on the market for eight years, or there's some other problem with them, then in the same way that member can say yes, no, or maybe. Well, the member, the, mem the, member, the member dealing with that directly with the client will know or, 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 um, usually what the circumstances are. The, the danger 
of it being a second-hand referral, as it were, is that there is at least a greater risk of uh, portfolios um, about which uh, nothing is known. Well, uh, well re with respect, my lord, possibly, possibly not. We, we, we really don't know. But there's no prohibition, for example, I don't think it's suggested, there's no prohibition against uh, me as an individual coming with my portfolio of 100 properties to a given agent and asking that agent to list all 100, or of a large development, a new Barrett Homes development with 1,500 properties somewhere, going to a given agent and saying, please list all 1,500 of my properties. Um, whatever controls there may be on the types of properties to be uploaded, Right Move and trusts, it seems, each of its individual members to look at each of, the, each of the proposed listings and to filter them out. And if they get it wrong, they come down and the member suffers whatever consequences they may, they may suffer. But the protection, insofar as objectively, insofar as Right Move is concerned, is that that member who has a con who has a contractual relationship with Rightmove remains the filter. They remain the ones in charge of their keys to the Rightmove website, and only they can upload properties to it. And of course, there's some risks with that. But in my submission, there's no. It's not a greater risk, simply because um, some of the listings come from another local agent who might say, "Please upload these five properties," as opposed to a developer who might say, "Please upload these ten thousand or fifteen hundred for me." Um, and finally, um, my lords, my, um, my learned friend relies on the fact that Clause 22, Paragraph 22, refers to uh, direct or indirect selling on or, or provision of access. Uh, that, in my, in my submission, is, is a bad point that doesn't go anywhere further, because this is difference is one of, uh, it's a qualitative difference, not a matter of degree. My lords will come to a decision about what to sell on or provide access to the services and features of your membership means. It's either my interpretation or it's Lord Burns or some other, and as to what third party it means. And that has either been breached or it hasn't. There's no, the, the, the direct and the indirect um, differential doesn't altogether come into that. Right. Um, my lords, I've, I've cut, cut pages out. <laughs> I'm on to my fourth submission, um, commercial interpretation. Um, uh, in my submission, my laws, my primary position, my primary submission is that the judge was right to say that a commercial assessment can't be used as an aid to construction uh, on the facts. But you don't get there if it's unambiguous. My lords, yes. Um, and this wasn't ambiguous. And there simply isn't the information before the court, either at first instance and certainly not on this appeal, to reach a properly informed opinion as to which way the commerciality of it goes. Uh, but if my lords on reflection were to carry out such an assessment, uh, I would ask that, or I'd submit that the commerciality actually favours my interpretation. Firstly, the point I've already made, um, that Rightmove has the ability to vary its prices in the ways I've shown in 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4. So if it goes awry and one member is loading up what Rightmove considers an excessive number of properties, Rightmove can increase its charges. Um, secondly, uh, my, my lords, uh, in my submission, um, objectively, it is commercially advantageous to Rightmove, for Rightmove, to have as many properties listed on their website by whatever means. Um, it is preferable in my submission, commercially for right move, to have 10,000 properties coming from, say, um, a, a single agent, including if some of them come from five other commercial agents, than it would be for right move to lose out on some of those 10,000 properties because the other agents chose not to uh, obtain their own uh, membership. Uh, because Rightmove gains uh, market dominance, more properties there on its website, there's more commercial activity, and there's more ability to charge uh, more money uh, to the members and obtain advertising revenue and market share. Depending who they are. I'm sorry, my lord. Depending whose properties they are. It may be counterproductive to have a larger number of properties from Rackman. Possibly. Um, 
possibly uh, my lord, yes. It is, I think it just illustrates your point. That it does, yeah. It's rather difficult to go down the commercial. Yeah. All, all commercial else objective. equal, want to see, uh, all else equal, I would submit the more properties you have, the better. Um, there may be exceptions uh, to that, and some property one doesn't want to have. But I accept that point. Um, my lords, I, uh, well, I do have submissions about clause of paragraph 11 of the technical guidelines, but I would it be safe for me to assume that it isn't going to feature it? It's not, it's not going to be found against me that paragraph 11 of the technical guidelines is the prohibition. Um, no, that's not relied on for that. Uh, yes, so, but in the, so um, I, I, won't, I won't make submissions as to why it doesn't have that. But do you accept, because this does cut across a number of the submissions you've been making about no signposting, wouldn't expect to find it in the technical guidelines and so on. Do you, do you accept that clause 11 does impose restrictions on the nature of the properties, the kinds of properties, that, uh, that can be advertised by reference to where the original instructions come from. Um, my lord, yes, I, I think I, I have to accept that, that this it, it doesn't constitute the prohibition which my friend is uh, seeking to establish, but it does speak to the types of properties that um, may be included within within the data. Right. I, I, I it's a two-edged question because, in, in one sense, it undermines the points you've been making about yes. not expecting to find it here. Yes. On the other hand, it, it improves your case well, on when you're not expecting to find it in clause 22. Yeah. Well, I, I, I suppose, my lord, um, my my submissions may still be good that one wouldn't expect to find. Um, buried in these technical guidelines, such a provision. Yes. The mere fact that one happens to do so, or, albeit not the one a learned friend is looking for, doesn't undermine my submissions that it's a surprising place for it to be. Right. Thank you. Um, right. Um, better point, maybe, the one my lord suggested, <laughs> is that it's not in clause 22. But, yes, certainly. That, that, unquestionably, that is the better point. That is the better point, my lord, which I also, if I may, gratefully adopt, um, but just to protect, as best I can, the submissions I was making as to the, the surprising nature, uh, why it's surprising to find commercial terms in, buried in these technical guidelines. Um, ground, ground two, my lord, uh, Zuckler's uh, terms and um, conditions. Now, in my, in my introductory um, submissions, my Lord, um, Lord Popperwell, or Justice Popperwell, asked me um, a uh, question as to, well, what happens if an online agent um, has uh, branch offices? Um, I overlooked in answering that the definition of online agent. Um, so I'll turn back to that, if I may, before I say anything else. That's tab 22 of the core bundle, page 249. Now, an, an online agent means an estate agent, lettings agent, and in Scotland, solicitor agent, and or commercial property agent that operates primarily via a website, bracket, rather than a physical branch, close bracket, and or does not operate through a local office network. Now, I spent a little time over lunch scrutinizing this, and in my submission, it should be interpreted as follows. In order to be an online agent, one must satisfy this first condition, i.e. one must operate primarily via a website rather than a physical branch. That condition must be satisfied. And one must not satisfy the second condition and or does not operate through a local office network. What that means in my submission is that if an agent has a local office network, i.e. three branches, it cannot be an online agent because it triggers that second part of the definition and thus ceases to be or is not an online agent. That would seem to render the first half completely otious. No, well, not quite, my lord, because I thought about that. Yes. The answer may be 
that I have a website and I have a single physical branch. And then in order to be an online agent, my business must operate primarily via my website, not via my physical branch primarily. So the company in this case is, is one clear example. It only has a website. Therefore, it's clearly an online agent. If the company had the website and a single branch, one would have to do that factual inquiry in the first half and decide whether it operated primarily via its website or primarily via its physical branch. If primarily website, online agent. If primarily physical branch, not an online agent. Then one does the second half of the inquiry. If it has a local branch network, because it has multiple, I has multiple branches, then it falls through the trap door and it ceases to be an online agent. And, and for that, for that reason, uh, my lord, 3.1.10 simply cannot ever apply to an online agent because there is no such thing as an online agent with, in, in Zoopla's terms, a local office network by multiple branches. So my apologies for the earlier, off the, too off the cuff answer to, to my Lord's question. Um, again, the, the simple overarching point is these Zoopla terms contain no um, express prohibition against listing properties on behalf of um, commercial agents. Again, notwithstanding that there are these uh, detailed sets of definitions and it would have been very uh, straightforward to have done so. Um, so my learned friend relies only on one clause in these terms as constituting and containing the, the prohibition, clause 3.1.10, um, uh, which we have obviously been looking at quite carefully. Um, and in, in my submission, clause 3.1.10 clearly doesn't prohibit uh, the company from placing adverts on behalf of other commercial letting agents for two reasons. Um, the first reason is that clause 3.1.10 uh, relates only to branch office locations. It has nothing to do at all with online agents as defined under the Zoopla terms. And secondly, um, my alternative submission and this one I always struggle to articulate, um, but clause 3.1.10 controls only which branch office locations may upload details, namely the branch office location that received the instruction from a third party. Clause 3.1.10 does not control what instructions received by that branch office location may be uploaded. So I'll elaborate briefly on, on those two points. Um, so my lords have already seen that there are clear and distinct definitions of agent and of online agent under the Zoopla terms. So objectively, the drafter of this contract had, had the concept of an online agent and of an agent firmly in mind. And um, the way that they are differentiated, as we've seen, is by their, uh, whether they have physical branches I, or branch office locations, or whether they operate primarily via um, a website and don't have um, a network of branch offices. Clause 3.1.10 refers only to branch offices and to branch office locations which must mean the same thing. As my lords observed in discussions with my learned friend this morning, in order for his analysis to get off the ground, um, branch offices and branch office locations must flip-flop between uh, different meanings within the same sentence. And that's inherently very unlikely. But it's also um, inherently unlikely that 3.1.10 is concerned uh, with online agents at all, 
<coughs> because built into the very definition of an online agent um, is an entity that doesn't operate primarily via a physical branch. Whereas 3.1.10 is concerned and refers exclusively to branch offices, which must mean physical branch offices in my submission. And as I started these submissions, it is concerned with a, with a member necessarily who has multiple branch office locations. Each of, each of its branch offices implying there are multiple of them, each of its branch offices will only upload details of the properties received instructions for specifically at each branch office location, and that no branch office will upload details of properties originating from any other branch office location. So 3.1.10 is concerned with a member who has multiple branch office locations, and, a, and as I've shown you in the definition of online agent, by definition, a member with multiple branch office locations is not um, an online agent. Um, my submission, no, no further analysis is, is strictly needed, but again, my learned, friends make, my learned friend relies upon matters of commercial purposive um, interpretation. As I, as I understand your submission, uh, it doesn't really depend upon uh, whether someone is or isn't an online agent. You simply say, look at the words of it, it's talking about physical branch offices. Yes. It, it, it's a consequence of that that it doesn't apply to an online agent because of the definition of online agent. But there's nothing else in the wording which takes online agents as a category outside its scope. Is that, is that fair? Yes, that, that is fair. Um, that is fair. But and I understand your submission, but I'm just slightly perplexed as to why you come into it through the definition of online agent, which, which really only goes to say it doesn't apply to online agents because of its terms talking about physical locations. That's, and that's, that's, the, that's the point. I, I, think, I think that is the point. And, and my Lord, if I'd heard this morning's discussion, I'd have probably come at it in that, in that way. But as a matter of historical artifact, the way in which I put it was that this, this simply doesn't apply to online agents. But my Lord is right. The, the way I get there is, uh, is in the way my Lord described. Um, so, so in summary, what you say is just take clause 3.1.10 on its face. On your submission, you say it's all about, just on its natural and ordinary meaning of the words actually used, it's all about um, physical branch offices and their locations. Um, and then what you say is, well, if uh, the defendants try and interpret it more broadly, so as to extend to something that isn't physical branches, then one of the problems they encounter is that this is a set of terms and conditions which does make specific provision for online agents. And yes, you then say there's a collision at that point. My Lord, yes. Unlike what might be inferred from what we've seen in the right move case, where your location is a branch which we actually know includes website because of the terms of um, so in right moves case, there are grounds for saying that a reference to a branch uh, does encompass or contemplate that actually it might be a website. But you say that there's no room for that in the case of the Zoopla conditions because of the different definitions yeah. which specifically cater for websites under a separate category of online agents. Provide, provide definitions in relation to branches which make clear that, uh, that they're different from websites. My Lord, yes, that, that's certainly entirely clear in the, um, in the Zoopla terms. There is that distinction. There is, there is no comparable distinction in the, in the right move terms. Um, as it happens, my response to Malone and Friends' reliance on paragraph 22 of the technical guidelines um, doesn't depend in the same way upon this distinction between online agents and website-based listings and, and other listings. Um, um, so, so I don't really have to... No, because it's, it's not branch-related. No, no, quite, quite. So, all well, is right, but I, I, I don't think it filters very much into the analysis required in answer to my learned friend's submission. Um, 
Um, so my lord's my learned friend says, well, there, there's no reason at all for um, clause 3.1.10 uh, not to apply to online agents because um, Zoopla would have the same interest in restricting them both in the same way, as I understand it. Um, in my submission, my lords, that's as my lords explored this morning. There's simply no way for us to come to a determinative view about the commerciality um, in relation to that point. So um, that isn't a we should that should not be in my submission used as an aid to construction. Um, but if it were to be, we have seen. Uh, in clause 3.4.8 that Zoopla imposes different charging structures on online agents and others so that suggests it does take a different commercial approach to them uh, and there's there's good reason for that in my submission at my lords because a, a branch office location a physical branch obtains its market presence from the fact it has a building on the high street um, in, in that building as I say in my skeleton there are young men and women trying to get in customers, showing them brochures, offering them cappuccino, um, doing all they can to increase their market position uh, using their physical branch as the base of their operations and, uh, and as their presence in the market. Um, an online only, an online agent, someone, a member who only has a website, doesn't operate in that same way. They operate via their website. So Zoopla would not have an interest in preventing the online agent from, um, was well, difficult to even know what it, what it said they'd be doing because they've only got one, they've only got one website, so they can't be swapping instructions between branches. They don't have multiple branches; they've only got a single website. But the reason why Zoopla wishes to prevent, um, uh, pr prevent as they do in 3.1.10, an instruction being received in one physical branch and being uploaded to the website of a different. Or uploaded via a different physical branch uh, is that is as I've described um, there is real investment in physical branches and so they are charged for on a per branch basis by Zoopla so there is really a fundamental difference um, And fun fundamentally, my lords, um, my learned friend accepts that the court has to interpret branch office location to mean website. And that, in my submission, just is a radical jarring of the, the normal use of language. Now, my, that's, my pri that's, that's all I've got to say about my primary uh, submission. My, my alternative submission, uh, this would arise if my Lords concluded that Clause 3.1.10 does apply um, to websites. So if, if a branch office location means a website. Um, and, and the point is this. Um, it is that clause 3.1.10 limits which branch offices may upload details. Namely, it is the branch office that has received the instruction at that branch office location. But it doesn't limit the type of customers for whom instructions may be uploaded or from whom instructions may be uploaded. Not the type of customer from whom instructions you say? were received at that branch office location, which we're pretending means pretending, a, pretending as a pejorative, which we're interpreting to mean website. So all it says is each of its branch offices will only upload details of properties they have received instructions for specifically at each branch office location, and no branch office will upload details of properties originating from any other branch office. So if we interpret branch office location to mean website, then this would simply say 
the member must only upload instructions received at that website and not from any other website. It doesn't tell you anything about what instructions, from whom, of what nature they must be. So it could be an instruction from another commercial agent, it could be an instruction from anyone. All you can't do is pass it from one branch office to another branch office. But if it just comes into your company via your website, you can upload it. Um, my, my lord's my, my learned friend spent a number of paragraphs in, in his skeleton submitting that the judge had strictly construed the, the Zoopla terms. I've addressed that in my skeleton argument, and I, I wasn't proposing to say anything more about it orally unless, yeah. unless that was a point which troubled my lord at all. Um, I'll, uh, I'll move on, but in short, as I've said in my skeleton, the judge was simply characterizing my own submissions, not his, not his reasoning. Um, my lords, that's all. That's all I had to say on ground two. Unless there are any other any other questions, um, I'll, I'll move to ground three, my lords. Um, my lords have already seen and considered the relevant clauses, clauses five and six of the sale and purchase. Uh, agreement which is behind uh, tab 17, so I won't go back uh, back through them. Um, so, so I would jump perhaps to the consequence of, of my learned friend's um, I interpretation. Uh, it, it would mean, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to what it means for there to be fraud or negligent non-disclosure. This is page 193, tab, tab 17, R, is clause 6.2. But some sort of inquiry must be carried out by, by the trial judge as to whether there has been fraud or negligent non-disclosure. What that means, put to one side for a moment. Um, I start with the submission that it would be very odd if an inquiry as to the committal of fraud or uh, negligent non-disclosure um, was being made um, in an artificially restricted way, looking only at the contents of a single disclosure letter and not taking into account... I don't think it's suggested that fraud is so limited. So I, I think it's only suggested that non-disclosure is so limited. Mr Lawson nods. Um, well... If, well, if that be so, then, um, then fair enough. The, the point remains, um, my lord. Um, well, that creates a further difficulty in my submission for my learned friend because the, um, the addition of the words needs to be even more refined. Um, one somehow needs to divine, I've, I've just made that mistake, so be it, but one somehow needs to divine that the inquiry of fraud is carried out on a totally open basis, but the inquiry of neglig as to negligent non-disclosure, only that bit is restricted by reference to the contents of the disclosure letter. So how on earth, I respectfully and rhetorically ask, is an objective reader supposed to know that only half of one exception to a limitation clause is limited in that way? But, but the point remains, one would have to carry out an inquiry as to whether there has been negligence, negligent non-disclosure, without considering the true and complete facts of what was known to the disclosers. One must shut one eye, one's eyes to that. Uh, one must shut one's eyes as to what was in fact known by the um, recipients, the, the victims of the alleged uh, negligent uh, non-disclosure. Their actual knowledge is irrelevant, and the actual disclosures made to them are irrelevant. But all that the trial judge may look at is the contents of the uh, disclosure letter. <coughs> well, could it be on this basis for the negligent non-disclosure, but since these things are often put in the alternative in relation to fraud, you would be looking at all of the same facts. So that it's, in one sense, it's see on on um, um, the appellant's reading of it is even more complex as a. Process 
process because yes. the judge is, may have to look at the same material for one purpose but then disregard it for another. My, my lord's right. Now, my learned friend hasn't pleaded fraud. He hasn't pleaded fraud. But if he had pleaded fraud, uh, I would be in the position of being entitled to um, cross-examine the defendants saying, well, look at this email you received. You, you knew full well as yeah. to right move and Zupo's inquiries with the company pre-contract. You knew it full well. So there was no fraud and there was no inducement to lie. And they would answer as they, as they will. And the judge might come to a conclusion, I'm, I'm with Mr. Goodkin uh, in relation to fraud. I find as a fact there was no inducement and the defendants knew full well um, everything about these alleged non-disclosures. As a matter of fact, I find that vis-a-vis -vis fraud that they knew it, but then I, when I'm coming to consider whether there's negligent non-disclosure, I have to pretend I don't know that. And I have to pretend I haven't made that factual finding. But as you accept, fraud isn't pleaded, so... Well, I totally it's, accept. It's, that's interesting, but academic. But, with present, um, sorry, Lord. But, but coming closer to the, to the present case, I mean, it might be said that the operation of this clause is pretty weird, whichever way you look at it. Because yeah. let's take it what in some ways is the, is the paradigm case to test the argument, which is suppose the fact in question was explicitly and clearly stated in an email, let us say, between the parties prior to the contract, and is not present in the disclosure letter. So it's there in black and white, everything is stated, it's clear, unambiguous, and yet it's left out of the disclosure letter. Now, one might say, on the one hand, why on earth something that has been expressly and clearly disclosed um, should um, uh, 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 trigger this? But on the other hand, you could say, well, in that case, why on earth didn't it go into the disclosure letter? That might be said to be extreme carelessness if you've actually expressly and clearly disclosed it, but then not to put it in the disclosure letter. Save, my lord, for the fact um, that there's no obligation to put anything in the disclosure letter. The disclosure letter is a document created for the benefit of the sellers to limit the scope of their warranties. So we're all grappling with the question as to, well, in the, in the absence of an obligation to, to give disclosure, what does this clause mean? But the one thing we know um, the claimants were not obliged to do is limit the ambit of their own warranties. So the disclosure letter is, in my submission, the very last place one would be looking ascertain whether there has been fraud or negligent non-disclosure. There's no room, is there, for the doctrine of estoppel to fill the gap that you say would be otherwise unfortunate. I mean, your, your essential point that uh, the court would be having to shut its eyes to the true facts, but to take my Lord's example where there's no dispute, fact expressly communicated, the parties would be proceeding on a common convention fact had been disclosed. But I suppose it could be said that if the clause meant that disclosure had to be in the disclosure letter, you wouldn't be going back on that or, or advancing a case which was contrary to that. That's one difficulty. Well, and, and the other difficulty is that, well, as you recall, this is an exception to a limitation clause on which I, I wish to rely. So I, I have to firstly show that I come within 6.1.3 um, point two, I have to first show that, um, sorry, uh, in relation to um, 6.1.3.1, I, I, I have to show that, um, um, so that's uh, accepted, which, which is which is accepted, and then we'll put to one side who has the burden of proof, but one or the other of us needs to show that this exception applies or, or doesn't uh, apply. So it's it's tricky to see how that how that estoppel. Uh, would work because this isn't a direct claim for 
for the uh, negligent non-disclosure, my lord, it, it's an it's an argument that this exception to the limitation applies. Yeah. All you'd be a stop. All you'd be a stop saying uh, is it wasn't disclosed. Yes. But you'd be a stop from saying it wasn't disclosed outside the disclosure letter, which doesn't help. C correct, my lord. It, it, exactly. It, my lord, friend's interpretation of yeah. clauses. Sorry. Clause I, yeah. So thinking out loud. I don't think that helps me. But but if that were, if that were with respect, my my lord's. Um, intuition as to what the outcome ought to be, then the ready way to achieve it is simply to interpret Clause 6.2 without adding the words in the disclosure letter that my learned friend contends for. Um, um, so, um, well, so, so there is then, so, so my submission, the natural ordinary meaning of, of these words um, supports my interpretation. There isn't a mention of the disclosure letter in 6.2, even though it's a defined uh, term and referred to elsewhere. So we, we've now gone to the ordinary meaning. Your first point was no reference to the disclosure letter. My Lord, yes. Understand that? What was the second point? Um, uh, th there is no reference to the disclosure letter, and, and as part of that point, even though the disclosure letter uh, is referred to elsewhere in these, uh, in these terms, most obviously in Clause 5, Paragraph 5, dealing with warranties. So where the party meant to refer to the disclosure letter, they did so. I think your point on ordinary meaning is to say non-disclosure. The ordinary meaning of that is you haven't disclosed it at all. Yes. Unless there's some limiting word, which there isn't. My Lord, yes. Certainly that. Um, I'm sorry. I'm whether that's a separate point from the absence of the reference to the disclosure letter, perhaps, is debated. But at any rate, they are two sides of the same problem. My lord, yes. Um, um, My lords, there's then the question of well, what does um, what does negligent non-disclosure mean um, in this context? Uh, that, in my submission, is a, is a difficulty principally for my learned friend to grapple with because it, it is the defendants who will be seeking to avail themselves of this exception uh, to the limitation. Uh, so, so if my lords remain, or if my lords conclude that uh, there is no adequate uh, clear explanation as to what negligent uh, non-disclosure means, well, well the starting point would be not to overturn the decision of the judge below, uh, certainly, but also um, not to add words into this uh, clause, um, because that in my submission would simply uh, compound the all right, but that's that's a, 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 perhaps a, a, an important point, at least in this sense. If you say, if, if I'm just putting in my own words what you just said, the judge hasn't determined, because he wasn't asked to determine, the meaning of the word non-negligent. All he was asked to determine was, and all he did determine, was the meaning of the word disclosure. Have I got you correctly? Well, he, he was asked to consider whether, in considering whether there has been negligent non-disclosure, one is limited to considering the contents of the disclosure letter. So I, I, I don't think he considered, I don't think he made a binding determination as to the meaning of disclosure or negligence at all. He simply identified, as, as he was asked to in, in my application, he identified what information may be taken into account in carrying out that analysis. Yeah, but where does that take us to? Because you were making a submission to the effect of it doesn't matter what negligent means. If it's a problem, it's a problem for the defendants. And in any event, that's a matter for trial. Yes. Assume just for the moment that we accept those submissions. Where where does it take us? 
I'd have to accept not not very far, my lord. I think I think I'd have to accept that because right. tr tr true enough, the issue the issue under appeal is simply what information may be taken into account uh, in ca in carrying out that exercise. I, I suppose if if either of us had a or if the court came to a definitive view as to what test was being, um, neither of us has actually made detailed submissions as to as to what negligent non-disclosure means. And that may be an important issue for trial. And so I suppose I'd submit, my lord, uh, that the court should be um, slow to offer an opinion as to the precise meaning of, of negligent non-disclosure, because really it remains a matter for the trial judge. Um, the issue before the court today is, in making that inquiry, whether whether the trial judge is limited to the contents of the, um, of, of the disclosure letter or not. Um, can, can I ask you about another point? Of course, my lord. It's just in my mind. Uh, and it really relates to uh, the point that Mr. Lawson makes about certainty. I note that in this disclosure letter, uh, there is, in fact, uh, I'm looking at tab 18, page 213, paragraph 118, that there there is disclosure, or deemed to be disclosure, of all matters which are apparent from any document which is disclosed, whether specifically or generally. So that it would be open to the parties, and that's what has happened in this case, essentially to say there is disclosure in the disclosure letter of anything that's been provided to you in writing or which is reasonably uh, apparent from it. So that actually the area on which the dispute is biting is matters that are alleged to have been disclosed orally but haven't been disclosed in writing. It's only if you've got some oral disclosure, which is therefore not in the disclosure letter, but is such that, that it said we did, we did disclose this, so you can't say non-disclosure. And in, in that context, uh, would there be some force in the argument? what this is doing, if it means disclosure in the disclosure letter, is at least uh, giving the scope of what has been disclosed, or the nature of what has been disclosed, an element of certainty, because it can be confined to documents quite easily, as was ha as happened in this case. Um, my, my Lord, that's, that's not a point which, which either of us has, has grappled with or, no, or, or argued. I'm uh, I'm afraid that's, I, one, that's one of the occupational hazards. It, uh, and I, I, I happily, <laughs> happily take it forward. Um, well, um, I can certainly see, see that interpretation, um, my lord, and, and, um, and I'd well, like Mr. Good King, I wondered about that. Yes. But then I, I saw it, which is disclosed whether specifically or generally. Part two is under the heading of specific disclosures, and it's not there. And under general disclosure, I couldn't make, I was thinking of the exchange of emails to which our attention has been drawn, I couldn't fit that under any of those categories 1.1.1 1 .1 to 1.1.7. 1 um, yes, the, the answer that I was going to give, but not one with a lot of confidence because I hadn't looked at it yet, was that I suspected, unfortunately for me, although perhaps fortunately for the purposes of this appeal, Unfortunately for me, this probably doesn't mean any document I've given you prior to the exchange of contracts. Um, it, it may be, it, it, it is probably the case, although I, I haven't scrutinised it, that um, it, this is meant to refer to disclosure given within the disclosure letter or referred to within the disclosure letter rather than other disclosure. It may be that I'm wrong about that, and, and, it, and there's a sensible way for me to argue that, that it applies more widely to any document which was, which was provided. Um, but, but I, I um, my but, off the cuff. Do I understand the position to be this, that with regard to the potential impact of paragraph 1.1.8 1 1 of the disclosure letter, that would be a matter for trial. Um, and the consequence of it would be that even if you lose on the present issue, that might give you another bite of the chariot trial. Um, 
my lord, it, it, it might well. But I, I mean, it might not. It might not, on, depending on what the proper interpretation but, of it is, and but, but, what, what but, inquiries would reveal. What's what's this was properly investigated. But, but I, I suspect that the, the point being made against me by um, um, by my lord, Lord Justice Popperwell, is that well, it may make more sense to limit um, disclosure to the contents of the disclosure letter if actually all it's excluding is oral is oral disclosure. So there'd be less mischief. Um, if Indeed, that, that, if that. that and, and I would be grateful for your answer to that question as well. Uh, my Lord, yes. Well, I, 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 I was just going to go back to the order that was actually granted, uh, because there may be a shortcut to this. Um, I suppose that the, the, the uh, tab four, page 35, a, a way to duck this question, and I submit it actually should be ducked, since neither of us has argued it. Uh, is that the declaration I obtained was in considering whether there has been fraud or negligent non-disclosure within the meaning of 6.2 of the contract, the assessment of what disclosure has been given by the claimants is not limited to the contents of the disclosure letter as defined in the contract. So an answer to this point, my lords, might be uh, that we leave this question open on the basis that clause 1.1.8 the reference to any document which is disclosed, those documents are not part of the contents of the disclosure letter. They would be documents referred to within the uh, disclosure letter. Because those documents aren't incorporated, well, perhaps they are incorporated into the... No, I, I, I'm sorry, my lords, I take that back because we see at 1.1, by way of general disclosure, the following matters are disclosed or deemed disclosed to the buyers. And then 1.1.8 is all matters apparent from any document which is disclosed, whether specifically or generally. Um, uh, uh, well, well, I understand your reticence about accepting that, that that's um, yeah, well, applies, I, to, applies to all documents. I suppose so I certainly it, it, in, in it, other in other um, it, larger. Indeed, my, my, uh, share I'm, purchase transactions where you have a, 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 a room of disclosed documents and so on. Yes. Um, well, one expects the disclosure letter to be confined to that which is specifically identified as in the electronic disclosure form. Yes, I, I'm really, my lord, seeking um, to a degree to be fair to both parties because Mr. Lawson, I assume, wouldn't wish to be saddled with the finding by this court um, that the reason. There was not this limitation. Is that every document I provided, my clients provided to his clients, um, were deemed to be disclosed and incorporated into the disclosure letter? That that would be obviously a significant disadvantage to Mr. Lawson, and I assume he would wish to be able to argue that point more fully and and at trial. So um, it, it's a tricky one, my lords. If if I, I suppose if this is a point which is of significant weight in, in my Lord's reasoning that Mr. Lawson and I, I'm sure, can make brief written submissions on it might might be a um, a, a way through. Um, I simply don't wish to, I wouldn't wish to commit either way, and I'm sorry for that. No, I, I think as far as I'm concerned, I, I think I've it, it's been explored sufficiently for my purposes. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm grateful, Lord. I, I suppose all I'd say is if, if that is the basis on, on which if that part of the appeal were were granted, and if that were the reason for it, I would respectfully ask my lords to, to, to record that within within the reasoning, so that I'm not saddled with um, losing that summary judgment and um, uh, and not having the benefit of, of that finding in relation to the ambit of, of one point one point. But your primary case remains paragraph one b of the judge's order. Yes, simply be upheld. Uh, I resist the appeal. That, that because you say. That uh, the assess that on a true construction of the provision, um, the uh, uh, assessment should not be limited to the disclosure letter. My lord, yes, precisely so. Um, and, and just, I see the time, but just extremely briefly, as as to the as to as to what uh, this non-disclosure may mean, and as to the commerciality, I'll attempt I'll attempt to wrap up those submissions uh, together. Uh, but back in the terms and conditions, um, tab, behind tab 17, page 193, 
Um, and the key words, none of the limitations contained in clause 6.1 apply to any claim under the warranties where there has been fraud uh, or negligent non-disclosure. Um, my lords, I, su I submit um, it, it would make sense for there to be um, a, a, a two-stage inquiry. Uh, the first stage would be for the trial judge to assess um, whether there has been a breach of a warranty, um, including by reference to the contents of the disclosure letter, which limits the ambit of the warranty, uh, and then to carry out a, a second and separate analysis as to whether there has been any fraud where that pleaded and it's not, or whether there has been any, any negligent non-disclosure, um, uh, which would be, uh, and the precise meaning of that will have to be determined at trial, but disclosure of a matter uh, which uh, something similar to misrepresentation, the test of misrepresentation. Uh, is, it a, is it a present uh, fact and matter which was, say, in, in the contemplation, which was uh, in the knowledge of the sellers um, that they all reasonably have to disclose uh, to the buyers? Um, uh, were they negligent in failing uh, to do so? Because there would, if they failed that test, if they negligently failed to disclose something that they ought to have, because objectively they'd have known it was likely to induce a purchase of the company or induce entering into the sale and purchase agreement. If they ought to have disclosed it but failed to do so, some culpability, some wrongdoing uh, would attach to them. Um, uh, and it would make sense um, if some uh, wrong has been committed, and I use it in that intentionally broad way, if some wrong has been committed, for the sellers to lose the benefit of the warranties. So it's a measure really of, of culpability, of wrongdoing, um, by failing to disclose something which they ought reasonably, acting as reasonable buyers say, which they ought, reason, reasonable sellers rather, which they ought reasonably to have disclosed. And if they are culpable in that fashion, then they lose the benefits, both as to liability caps and time periods and the other uh, limitations found in Clause 6.1. Uh, and as hard as I've tried to think about this, th that's the best I can come up with, I'm afraid, because I, it, it can't, in my submission, be negligent non-disclosure from the disclosure letter, because there's no obligation to put anything in there. Well, you have the same problem, whichever it is, right? Whether, we we whether have a problem. Whether it's disclosure in the disclosure letter or whether it's disclosure outside the disclosure yes. letter. Precisely. Uh, what, and, and that's what, what amounts to negligence? Was it a duty to, to, to meet a standard yeah. uh, in relation to what should be disclosed and it isn't defined, whichever it is? Yeah, my lord, something, the best I can come up with, my lord, is something like misrepresentation, something which ought to be disclosed because objectively, um, uh, 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 it's objectively uh, knowable that it would have uh, induced entering into the contract, something like that, or the terms on which um, the, the sellers enter. Um, extremely brief, my lords. Contra proferentum, I submit it. It just doesn't help uh, on the facts of of this case or any other, probably in in recent decades. Um, but if it were to be applied, I, I do submit, as my lord Lord Justice Arnold observed, that we are dealing here with an exception to a limitation clause, and so the, the proferens would be the defendants. So the contra proferentum rule would work against them, not for them. Um, yes, my lords, I think those are my submissions, unless there's any other points I can assist with. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Mr. Lawson, anything in reply? Yes, Lord, I have a couple of brief points, if that's okay. Um, the, well, on the right move terms, the, the question of my lawyer friend took you to various definitions and said at the same point this could have been spelt out more clearly. The, the answer to that is the answer that my lawyer or Justice Coulson gave before the break, which is it just so happens that on the facts we are concerned with the activity of um, agents allowing other agents to use their membership or um, re sleeving by, by commercial letting agents. That's the specific activity on the facts and the declaration that we sought. My point simply, there is a prohibition in Clause 22, which is 
drafted in the terms that it is, and it, it's apt to catch that type of conduct. It may catch other types of conduct as well. So in, in my submission, there's nothing in the point that they don't specifically use the words commercial letting agents, um, or that that type of conduct could have been more specifically prohibited. So it's true, um, but it, there's not a point that takes the respondents anywhere. Secondly, um, I understood my learned friend to accept that his big point about the pricing clause in the right move in, um, provisions that allows right move to increase the prices charged to a member would apply on the facts, must apply on the facts of this case. Now, as I showed my lord, that, that term, clause 5.4 um, in particular, only kicks into play if you've got a breach of the technical guidelines. Or alternatively, he was made, focusing his submissions to ask more on 5.3. Well, well in fairness, in his scouting, he does rely on the whole ambit of 5, including 5.4. Oh, to be sure, you're yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But my, it, my understanding is that is accepted, that there would be a breach which allows for if, he, if he's right to refer to 5.4 at all, there must be a breach of the technical guidelines. We can go to it quickly. But there doesn't need to be for 5.3. Well, for 5.3, you still, um, well, it's page 230 of your core bundle, tab, tab 20. Um, that would still apply if, if right move believes your data includes details of properties of land, not from one of your locations. Um, and according to the guidelines, you may say, communicate to you, they would then reserve the right to charge uh, for additional locations. There's still that problem, that activity going on. Now, in, in my submission, if, if that's what's happened on the facts, that's what's going on, um, th then we have, a, we, have, we have a breach. We have a breach of 22. Um, we have reselling to other agents. The, the, the commercial point then about whether it's in right moves interest um, to increase the fees at charges and to exercise this clause, or alternatively, just to suspend the member or, or terminate them, um, doesn't then arise. The, the key point is a breach um, of the prohibition, my lords, not, not whether the pricing clause is actually ex um, excised by right move in practice. The third and final point on the right move conditions um, were submissions about the technical guidelines and the fact that prohibition can be found there. And as my lord, Lord Justice Bothwell points out, um, there's nothing in this fact that they, they're headed the technical guidelines that contain substantive pro uh, prohibitions to allow and acceptance, such as Clause 11. But even on his own case, they must contain substantive prohibitions. Because as I understand his case on what Clause 22 means, it means at least that as a member of right move, you can't hand out your username and password details, he says. And in my submission, that, that is a substantive prohibition on the what? On the what you can do as a member. And it's found in the technical guidelines. So, so his, his whole point about these are technical guidelines and data quality requirements doesn't, doesn't take it anywhere. The final point about this, and in my submission, he does not really have an answer to it, is my reliance on the words directly or indirectly. And all, all he said about that was, well, reselling re by, by allowing someone access to your membership or posting an advert for them is a, is a qualitative difference, not one of degree. Well, that's not really an answer. I mean, if you're handing out the keys to your membership, you are reselling or providing access directly. Um, and if you, if you say to another agent, well, don't worry about it. It's actually easy, even easier. I don't need to give you my username and password. I'll just post some adverts for you instead for a fee. In my submission, you're doing so indirectly. Uh, and also, I've shown you the question of whether there's been indirect reselling is assessed by right move. It's in their opinion. And of course, that, that wording is important wording, directly or indirectly, which is added in the 2014 terms. In my submission, it's, it's, it's designed to cut through the kind of distinctions that my learner friend draws. But you don't get into the, the detailed inquiries subdividing the nature of the services being provided. You just say, well, it's obvious. If it's, if it's not direct reselling or providing access, you're doing it indirectly, and we prohibit that as well. So that's the, that's the right move terms. On Zoop, as I showed my lord, the prohibition we, uh, my lords, the prohibition we rely on in 3.1.10 applies to all members. And members are defined simply as agents or developers. And again, I understand my learned friend to have accepted but an online agent is simply a subset of, of agents. So in my submission, these, these terms are all meant to apply to, to members, whether they are online agents uh, or, or traditional agents. My learning friend also accepted, in answer to a question, for, to a question from 
or just as Popwell, you can have an online agent that has, a, I think I understand to accept, at least one branch, he would accept. So it operates primarily from its website, but it does have at least one branch access. So in his case, clause 3.1.10 would apply to that member to stop it taking business from other agents at its branch, but it wouldn't apply, as I understand it, if it was accepting business from other commercial agents on its website. That's my understanding of, of, of the distinction he draws. But in my suspicion, that can't be right, because the prohibition would, set, would depend merely on the form in which the instruction was received. Was it received by the member through its website, or was it received through its high street branch? And, and there's no logic, in my suspicion, for, for, for drawing that distinction. If, if you're having this prohibition on this type of activity, it should be applied consistently. Otherwise, it could be easily circumvented. If you are a commercial agent who doesn't want to pay right, uh, Zoopla's fees, instead of uh, going to the branch of a member where you're prohibited from, from <laughs> signing up with it, you just sign up on its website instead. And that wouldn't be prohibited on my learning friend's case, as I understand it. The third the final point my learning friend made on Zoopla uh, was a distinction between the place where the instruction was received, which I, which I, I struggle to follow slightly, my, my, my lords, but the simple answer to it in my submission um, is, is the prohibition that we rely on, the key words of it, the second part of the clause. No branch office will upload details of the properties originating from any other branch office location. Now, if you're uploading properties that are actually the clients of another agent, then in my submission of necessity, those instructions originated from somewhere other than your own branch or your own website. They originated from a branch or a website of some other agent. It's very different if they are simply normal private um, residential landlords and they come to you directly. The instructions and the details of the properties originate from your own branch or your own website. The clause applies. So the, there's, there's no point in this distinction about where the instructions were received my learned friend tried to draw. <coughs> Lord, that then leaves just clause six, which you've obviously heard extensive argument about some uh, very short clause. Um, my learned friend's main point on this is that it prohibit the court from, from considering the facts, and there's something odd about that. Well, I, I've dealt first with the distinction between fraud and non-disclosure. <coughs> In my submission, it's, it's perfectly possible you could have a situation where the court, having looked at the facts, decides there is no case in fraud, and therefore that part of the clause doesn't apply. But even if there is no fraud, there was nevertheless a non-disclosure, and therefore the second part applies. So that's, that, that difference between those two points is not a problem. Uh, in terms of not being able to consider the facts, of course, if, if there's a claim for misrepresentation or fraud, an actual claim for misrepresentation or fraud, then the court would consider the facts. It would consider the email that my learned friend referred to. All, all we're saying is, when you get to the exception to this limitation clause in 6.2, one, one doesn't conduct a roving inquiry that point into all the background facts. One simply asks the simple question, has this matter been disclosed in the letter, uh, and is that, fa that failure to disclose careless or not? Uh, on, on my case, that's a fairly simple inquiry, uh, as was pointed out to my learned friend. Because if, if one knows of a particular breach or a matter, um, or, or could easily discover it, then it's easy to say that that's a negligent failure to enclose it, or to include it in the letter. It's careless not to do so. That, that, can, that can be made to make sense on my interpretation. Contrast, and my learned friend's interpretation, in my submission, he, he's really able to offer no explanation to you as what a negligent non-disclosure outside of the disclosure letter at some point in the negotiations would, would mean, uh, or what, how, how that would actually, what that would be on the facts and what the trial judge will have to say when, when confronted with that, to work out what, what could fall within that category, um, which is a position of uncertainty, which is, which is unsatisfactory. Um, as I say, my, my interpretation is the one that can make sense of this clause and the unusual wording. Is it your submission that the word negligence in this clause includes failing to protect your own interests? My, Lord, the, my, my submission is it, it, it includes... Or specifically, the vendors failing to protect their own. 
that's not how I would put it include a failure to include something in the disclosure letter of which you're aware. I, I accept there are circumstances in which it would and be... And that's a failure to protect their own interests because, of course, they cut down the scale of the warranties by putting it in the disclosure letter. It could be depending on the facts. It could be because if you disclose something under 5.2, that then cuts down the scope of the warranties. But as I've said, there, there are scenarios you can, you can posit it when it would be in the interest of the vendor um, to keep something out of the disclosure letter. So do I understand your answer to my question is yes, you submit negligent includes failure to protect your own interests as vendors? Well, the, the, what I would accept is that uh, is a potential consequence of not disclosing something in, not in the disclosure letter. The one, one then doesn't get to carve out from the warranties. I'm sorry. I'm going to press you for a yes or no answer. You're free to say that the answer to my question is no, but it's a binary question. It's a yes or a no. Well, well look, my, my answer is no, because there are circumstances in which it would be in the vendor's, or there would be an incentive for the vendor not to disclose something in, in the disclosure letter, which was the example I gave, which is there's some particularly important or, or breach, and what they decide to do is just sit quietly and hope the six month period elapses rather than put it in the letter in which case the buyer might just walk away. So the, the purpose of the clause in my submission is to incentivize disclosure in the letter. Um, it's a contractual document, um, and, and that makes sense on my submission. The, 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 the something that either should or shouldn't be disclosed we're talking about is that which makes the warranty untrue, mm. which is the warranty. So can, can you give me an example of, of a failure to put that something into the disclosure letter that would be anything other than negligent or deliberate? Um, my, my Lord, if it was something, <laughs> obviously a factual question. W one example would, would be uh, if, if it was a matter of which the vendor was unaware uh, and which I had no basis possibly to, to be aware. In those circumstances, it's difficult to see how that could be classed as a negligent failure to include something in the disclosure letter. It's difficult to criticise the vendor in that situation. Um, if it was How can a, you disclose something of which you're not aware? Would, would the, that is my point, my lord. One, one wouldn't be in the situation, one wouldn't be putting it in the letter, and there could be no suggestion that there was a negligent non-disclosure in that circumstance. It wouldn't be in the letter, and I wouldn't be able to say that was a negligent failure because my other friend but would it be, my, my Lord's point is, would it really be categorised as a failure to disclose at all? Well, my, uh, my suspicion that would make, it was, it's a non-disclosure, the matter is not disclosed. It doesn't appear in the letter. For example, the breach of 8.3 and the use of agents doesn't appear in the letter. It was not disclosed in the letter. It's a matter of language, that's possible. And then they can have a debate about whether that non-inclusion is, is negligent or, or not, depending on the, the knowledge of the vendor. Well, those, are, those are my only submissions in reply. Right, thank you very much. Well, thank you both very much. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, your oral submissions today have been very helpful. Um, you will anticipate that we will reserve our judgments. Um, when you get them, you will get them in draft. Uh, that is for you to correct our grammar uh, syntax and any background matters of fact that we may have uh, got wrong, it's not, I'm afraid, a chance to correct our reasoning. Um, uh, and uh, obviously we hope to get those uh, judgments out to you as soon as possible. Um, once you've got them, we would invite you to agree the order consequential upon the draft judgments, um, uh, and when we hand down the judgments, uh, we don't expect parties to attend. If, for whatever reason, you can't agree the order, uh, then um, we would expect you to provide exceedingly short written submissions on any particular points on which the parties have not been able to agree, and we will deal with those uh, in writing, either at the time of the hand down, um, shortly before, or in extremis after. But the, uh, the best course is for the order to be agreed or for the points to be uh, identified as outstanding prior to the handdown of the judgment. 
Right, thank you all very much.